Okay. We are at uh, one minute ETA. Okay. People, a lot of people like to roll in last minute though. So we'll give them a minute before we introduce you. Okay, great. Okay. Isn't it great? The designer original. Yeah. Okay. And uh, Stephen, he can share his screen. Okay, good. Um, all right. Uh, welcome, everyone, to our last colloquium. I imagine uh, it's a busy week of the semester with people starting to do finals and everything like that. Um, we're glad to have our uh, last speaker of the semester, Dr. Chris Silver, who's in the Department of Urban and Regional Planning. And his talk is about planning in an era of rapid urbanization, the case of Indonesia. Uh, Chris Silver is a professor of urban and regional planning who joined the faculty at UF in 2006 uh, as a dean of the College of Design, Construction and Planning. He has now uh, done his time in that position for 10 years, I guess. That yeah. was enough, right? And uh, now, he's, now he's more focused on research. Um, he's writing books on planning the mega city, looking at Jakarta in the um, 20th century, and just released a book on urban flood risk management uh, with a specific case of Jakarta. He's a four time Fulbright senior scholar to Indonesia. And so please welcome Dr. Chris Silver. Thank you, uh, Joanna. Thanks for the, the, the kind introduction and thanks for the invitation uh, to present today. Am I coming through clearly? I just want to double check that before I get going. I'm going to make the sound a little louder, but I think we can all hear you now. Okay, perfect. So uh, as, as the introduction suggested, uh, I'm do my work on Indonesia and Jakarta uh, in particular. Uh, and to sort of connect the dots, I became uh, engaged in Indonesia as a result of the first Fulbright I did back in 1989 uh, and 1990. And then I was back there again in 1992 uh, and then uh, did uh, another one in 2004. And then most recently, I was there in 2019 for five and a half months. Uh, and actually, a lot of the images and, and a lot of the results that I was able to put together uh, for my uh, most recent book are really, uh, were really helped by that final Fulbright because things really had changed quite a bit. Um, I'm a historian by training, uh, and I've actually found history to be critically uh, important in understanding the current city because um, in many ways, Indonesia is still uh, sort of living with much of its colonial legacy, at least in terms of the physical environment, but it's a very different place and, and, uh, uh, and it has changed a lot. But as you'll see, there, there certainly is a, a carryover uh, from that colonial period. Uh, and as Joanna mentioned, um, I've done two books and a bunch of articles and chapters, but the very first book, Planning the Megacity, Jakarta in the 20th Century, um, was, I guess, probably my uh, act of bravery to try to understand urbanization in a place that obviously I lived there for a while as a Fulbright. I actually worked as a consultant there for three years, um, but the complexity of their politics, their culture, uh, as well as the way in which they uh, plan and manage and develop their cities was something that, that it took a lot of time to figure it out and, and then to take a shot at it. Well, I wrote the book and it, and it had a good, it's had really good visibility. It's probably for the 20th century, the really the only thing that comprehensively looks at planning, but a good, Indonesian friend of mine who actually teaches here in the United States, he did a review of it and he said, the book's really good, but it's just history. What about the current challenges? And so that's what led uh, 
uh, over the past eight to 10 years to looking at the issue of uh, urban floods in Jakarta. And that will form a big part of what I talk about today, but I have to put it in the bigger context because uh, it's really a regional issue. It's not just uh, an issue for the, the city uh, of Jakarta. Um, Indonesia is the fourth most populous country in the world. Uh, and like the US is an urban nation now, having crossed the 50% urban mark uh, in 2011. It's actually now close to about 60% urban and the growth of its urban citizenry is really roughly double the annual population growth for the nation uh, as a whole. And we see some of the effects of this in the demographic and physical transformation of its largest cities, as well as the proliferation of cities of 200,000 or more. Uh, and this map shows you uh, the cities. There are 65 of them scattered throughout the archipelago according to the 2020 census. And it's not just urban population growth, but the physical transformation of formerly rural agricultural lands in city spaces, into city spaces, that has produced fundamental environmental changes. And nowhere is this more evident in the region than in the region surrounding Jakarta, the capital city, where dynamic urban growth really has been taking place over the past half century. The 2020 census tells part of the story. 10 of the 18 most populous cities are in Jakarta uh, and along or, or along its periphery. And I say in Jakarta because the capital city is actually composed of five separate cities. The other five big cities have developed outside of Jakarta along its periphery. Uh, these, uh, these surrounding cities and their hinterlands account for two thirds of the more than 30 million residents in the metropolitan region. Peripheral cities, Bekasi, Depok, and Depok is where the University of Indonesia is, is located, right at the edge of Jakarta. Tangeran, and now Tangeran is broken up into uh, Tangeran and South Tangeran, and then Bogor, one of the older uh, peripheral cities that was around actually back in the 19th century. This is where the dynamic urban physical growth is especially prevalent. All of them were envisioned in plans prepared during the early years of Indonesia's independence, but they were planned as compact, carefully planned suburban enclaves surrounded by green spaces, not as sprawling cities on the scale that they've become. And this image of uh, Fatmawati city center uh, sort of uh, reflects that because the, all those buildings, now these are, some of them have been built, but this is a, a, a rendering of what was going there, are built on the golf course I used to play on back in 1989-90, right next to a little community hospital, all gone, cleared away. The most recent addition is a new city under construction uh, and marketing itself as a clone of Manhattan uh, known as Micarta. And this promises to be a smart and green, but home to a million population located even further to the east, deeper into the periphery uh, surrounding Jakarta. To support the rapid growth of the region taking place within Jakarta and beyond, the government has invested heavily in transportation infrastructure, given the long-standing problems of traffic congestion. The new infrastructure for uh, transportation infrastructure began in Jakarta in 2004 with development of what has grown into the world's most expansive bus rapid transit system called Trans Jakarta. Uh, it is complemented by a modernized commuter railway and construction of lots of roads. Here's a map showing uh, six new toll roads planned but uh, uh, for 2020, but they were hoping to push them sooner. And more recently, two long overdue fixed rail transit systems. These include a light rail connecting central Jakarta to urban hubs in the periphery, but also the first line of the Jakarta Metro uh, transit, a subway constructed more than 30 years after it was first proposed, uh, 
but finally opened in April of 2019. I did have a chance to ride on this wonderful addition to the transportation network. In fact, I took this picture uh, during one of its inaugural runs, a rail line to the international airport from downtown, but more importantly, millions of individual vehicles, 38 million to be exact, motorcycles, taxis, and private cars, carry individuals to and fro on the roads in this rapidly growing and increasingly modernized urban agglomeration. Yet, shortly after my initial ride on Jakarta's new MRT and following the victory of Joko Widodo uh, to a second term as uh, Indonesia's uh, president, the government announced the decision to remove the capital from Jakarta to a new location outside of Java. And here's a map showing where it is somewhere in between Balipapan and Samarinda in the province called East Kalimantan, although we know it in the West traditionally as Borneo, and they still call it Borneo, but it's East Kalimantan. So why? Why are they moving the capital? One of the several reasons given by the government was to situate the capital in a more central locale in the country to better serve the whole Indonesian nation. Another was to find a location less prone to natural disasters, such as the flooding experienced in Jakarta, which is what I'll discuss a bit more fully shortly, and earthquakes uh, that also hit Java. The traffic congestion was mentioned as as well, despite the already implemented and planned improvements for the Jakarta metro area. Maybe it was motivation similar to that of Sukarno, Indonesia's first president, uh, who proposed in the 1950s a new capital city, actually uh, appropriately in central Borneo, uh, in the town of Palankaraya, as a way to emulate Brazil's development of the modernist capital city of Brasilia. The Palancaraya plan never was implemented, although a couple of grand streets, and this is one of them, uh, were added to this provincial town. In Jokowi's case, it could be to create a showcase of the green and smart city that Jakarta seems unable to achieve, especially given Indonesia's warm and pretty, pretty honest embrace of the sustainable uh, development goals. Although I cannot definitively answer the why question, uh, except to identify uh, as I have what was said publicly, I would suggest that multiple factors are at play. And one that is not widely cited, but which I think is significant, is that beneath the veneer of modernism in the modern, uh, in the rapidly gro growing uh, Jakarta metropolitan region, one finds a polluted and poorly serviced city at its center. The failure of planning and public intervention to create a livable urban environment for so many of its inhabitants has created a daunting task that the national government has decided it's too difficult to tackle. It's widely recognized, as I will show, that Jakarta is confronting a profound environmental crisis the decision to move the capital flows from a long-standing discussion, sometimes finding its way into the media, that large parts of the city ought to be abandoned or completely rebuilt in some other way if Jakarta is to remain functional. The problem, as I point out, is that the costs of decades of inaction have made the remediation costs prohibitive and potential interventions really not foolproof. In the meantime, the inactions have created a whole array of costs for a great many of its citizens, and moving the capital is not going to change their circumstances. But there are ways I would suggest, and I'll, I'll talk about it at the end, to make a difference. And, and these I will uh, end my presentation with. But in the interest of time and to explain the evolution of the environmental crisis, I'm going to draw on four distinct uh, epics of Jakarta's 400 year history to show how the city has gotten to this point and to make the case that strong environmental planning was the key to the city's early successes and its neglect a prime factor in its current crisis. Um, I'm going to use a variety of lithographs and photos to furnish data from the past, beginning with the 17th and 18th century, 
as the Dutch established its dominion over the Indonesian archipelago and created the water city of Batavia. Then I'll move to the last half of the colonial rule uh, in the uh, 20th century until the Japanese invasion in 1942, when more comprehensive environmental planning emerged. But then I skip to the 50s and 70s when Sukarno and then Suharto shaped the planning processes of Jakarta in ways that seemed to pay little attention to the environment that they were transforming. And I'll end with the current crises beginning in the 1990s that I suggest are really the major impetus uh, behind the move to create a, a new capital city. The selection of the site, this is Epic One, uh, for the Batavia settlement, as with most 17th century city location projects, was because of its relationship to water. There had been a small harbor on the site they picked. Uh, it's still there. Uh, it's known as Sunda Kalapa, and, and it's located near the mouth of, of the Chilliwang River. Um, wooden, uh, traditional wooden ships still find a home there to serve the outer islands. The Chilliwang is one of 13 rivers and tributaries that feed this area and a perfect environment for the Dutch to create a water city to serve their commercial desires in a style like at home. Several images show clearly how the Dutch harnessed uh, the rivers and engineered a system of canals to support the settlement of Batavia uh, as the main trade hub and administrative center of the East Indies. Uh, at their East Indies empire. The water resources also supported a massive agricultural enterprise uh, that, uh, that was created in the area surrounding the settlement. It's important to emphasize that managing the environment was the preeminent concern of this colonial city with water management at the top of the list, and they did it quite well. Considerable public expenditure went into expanding and maintaining the engineered waterways, dredging them regularly to remove the silt carried down from upstream. It was this silt that had formed thousands of years earlier, the land on which they built Batavia. Despite heavy rainfall during the so-called rainy season, still have the rainy season that runs from December to March, and with all of these rivers to tap, it was not flooding, but rather drought that was, and low water levels that proved a perennial challenge during the dry season. Water shortage, shortages were a consequence of drawing off so much water for the agricultural production. To compensate, new canals were built to tap other sources. Maps of the settlement during the 17th and 18th centuries uh, show how the Dutch planned and maintained a rather compact city. In 1673, there were 27,000 people living in Batavia uh, in its walled uh, compound, uh, only 2,000 of whom were Dutch, the re remainder composed of immigrants, slaves. As the population grew beyond the capacity of the original settlement uh, or, and the original footprint, new settlements spread southward in a linear pattern. And that's what this map shows is how they stuck basically to the high ground uh, uh, to the east and west of the Chilliwang, uh, because beyond that, uh, the, uh, the lowlands were very swampy and unfit for formal structures. Without glorifying the colonial epic and, and overgeneralizing perhaps just to, to get through this first epic, it is fair to say the Dutch took environmental stewardship seriously in the 17th and 18th centuries and sustained a reasonably well-functioning city. In fact, it was, it was regarded as the queen city uh, of the East because of how well it was run. If we jump ahead to the late 19th century, the second epic uh, city uh, of the city that I wanna look at, it's noteworthy that Batavia's settlement pattern had not diverged appreciably from the original plan, except that the Euro European community had grown in size and pushed further southward again, sticking to high ground between several of the rivers. The uh, space to develop more luxurious houses began when the governor general Dandels in the early 19th century tore down the walls of the original city for building material for a new governor general palace in the Southern area known as Belta Breden. Uh, 
Between the 1890s and 1940s, this was the prime development area of new communities to accommodate the now greatly expanded European population and included planned neighborhoods such as Mentang. This happens to be where Barack Obama lived as Barry and he might've lived on this street. This is, you still see the street pattern that's there uh, when his mother worked at, uh, in Jakarta. The canals and rivers of the old city were no longer so central to Batavia's life and were absent from the landscape uh, of the new expanded city. Batavia had shifted to new sources of water for its expanded population, access from artesian wells beginning in the later part of the 19th century. This provided improved water quality as well as quantity. The canals remained as places for the indigenous population to ex access water since it was not piped into the kampungs, with, and the kampungs are the traditional indigenous uh, neighborhoods or villages, urban villages. At the same time, the economic vitality of the traditional waterfront declined when the modern harbor at Tanjung Priok was built in the late 19th century to the east of the city to accommodate the larger ships. Environmental concerns remained important, but shifted during the 1920s and 1930s from the waterways to the housing conditions in indigenous communities owing to overall public health concerns. The one waterway concern was the possibility of flooding and one flood event in 1918 led to the first flood mitigation project, the Van Breen Canal, which is shown here, now known as the West Flood Canal. And this was constructed in the 1920s to carry water uh, from the upstream water that threatened Mentang, that neighborhood I showed before, along the Western boundaries of Batavia to the sea. Apart from that one 1918 flood event that prompted construction of the Van Breen Canal, it's remarkable how inconsequential the flood problem was for Batavia given the hydrology of the area that I showed you before with the map of all the rivers and the tributaries. The leading Dutch planner during the 1920s, Thomas Carsten, was less concerned, and his image is down here in the, in the right hand corner, uh, was less concerned with flooding than with the need for improved conditions in the indigenous communities that could be achieved through better regulation of land development. The challenge was to accommodate in a suitable environment the growing population that in 1938 had uh, grown to approximately 435,000. Uh, this figure says 553, but again, they, they, the census were, were not entirely accurate, but the point was it was a, uh, again, a growing population more worried about housing uh, and managing the canal system. The population pressures accelerated in the third epoch I wanna focus on the post-independence era from the 1950s through the 1970s. Early on in the Sukarno era, there was an aggressive community building program financed by the government, but largely to accommodate the extensive civil service corps needed in the new capital city. Uh, the first and most ambitious of these projects was uh, Kibayar and Baru, a community connected by a new highway, actually the first cloverleaf ever built in Southeast Asia, and here it is. Um, and this was again, another of Sukarno's modernizing building projects uh, that connected to South Jakarta. Originally intended to accommodate some working class families, that component of the Kibayan Baru uh, project was removed. Another ambitious housing project specifically designed for low and moderate income residents that included pipe water and sewer was a plan for a satellite city known as Pulau Mas. And here's the uh, plan of Pulau Mas housing for the masses. Designed with the help of the United Nations based on a scheme mirroring the social housing of Denmark, it promised to accommodate up to 200,000 residents when fully built out. Proposed under the administration of Ali Sadiqin, uh, who was governor of Jakarta in the late 1960s and who had been appointed by Sukarno but served long after 
uh, his, with his successor, Suharto, the project was instead turned over to private developers. The developers converted it to a much smaller supply of market rate housing because of limited public funds. Instead of this idealized community for the working class, small clusters of public housing were built nearby uh, the, what became the upscale uh, Pulo Mas neighborhood. Discussions on how to accommodate the millions of migrants pouring into Jakarta shifted from public construction plans to self-help as the primary uh, planning policy. But of course, the government helped the private sector secure land for uh, the revised development scheme for Pulo Mas for upper income housing, as it did for other middle income communities in Jakarta. Sadiqan's alternative for the masses, an alternative continued for the next several decades, was the Kampung Improvement Program. Under the KIPP strategy, modest government support enabled residents of selected communities to construct some communal toilet facilities, add a community water pipe, paved walkways, improved drainage, all as incentives for them to make housing improvements to create a generally enhanced environment. Since the KIPs were limited to select areas, the vast majority of residents were not covered and had to fend for themselves on unoccupied lands along the rivers, canals, and railroad lines, and even under highways. These self-built facilities lack permanent water and sanitary infrastructure. For the water, they relied either on nearby public taps or on water vendors. For sanitation and washing, they, they used the rivers and canals as, as they had back in the earlier times, as I showed you uh, in a previous image. Informal communities were not recognized in Jakarta's plans, but were included as other land uses to be transformed to replace them later on. The planning model operable for Jakarta by the 1970s emphasized peripheral development, calling for a string of planned clusters circling the city. And one of these actually was Pulo Mas. The idea was to concentrate new development in these clusters and to preserve green areas between the new suburban settlements. The planners suggested that the new communities would be connected by train service to employment in the center city. The trains were built but what took place under the, under the Suharto New Order government, and that's, that's Suharto in the uh, fatigues, um, was construction of a massive network of circumferential toll roads. In this, they were explicitly copying the US model of car-oriented suburban development to support their peripheral development schemes. Although the initial plans for this suburban development were devised in the 1950s and refined through the 1970s, it was the 1980s and 1990s prior to the Asian crisis of the late 1990s that witnessed the accelerated suburban development around Jakarta that ultimately created the dominance of the periphery over the core city. Indonesia's leading planning scholar, Tommy, Tommy Fairman, uh, has shown that the population growth was facilitated by 23 subdivisions of between 500 or 506,000 hectares in size built between the 1980s uh, and 2000. A continuous array of Jakarta focused and metropolitan level plans call for regulation of this development, protect critical green areas, to address growing pollution of the waterways owing to an adequate sanitation infrastructure and strategies to address a growing incidence of flooding. But rather than adhere to the plans, the government essentially deferred to the private sector to do the land planning, as in Bumi Serpong Demai, <clears throat> once the toll highways were constructed, and also through private sector, in this case, benefiting the Suharto children uh, and their cronies. The public responsibilities to address the environmental problems of its waterways to extend clean water service to more city residents and to deal with pollution were, routine, were routinely deferred, often because of inadequate funding, but also because of conflicting priorities. The 1990s proved to be decisive for the future of the city for several reasons. In the mid 1990s, Suharto announced plans to build a new waterfront city to revive the shoreline where Batavia had originated. 
it was desired as space for new development for for the new development community, and that included firms which in, which uh, involved his children uh, as well as his friends. The intent was to mirror the land reclamation successes that other Asian cities had experienced. At the same time, Jakarta began to deal with its first two major floods, one in 1990 and a much greater in inundation in 1995-96 that devastated huge sections of the city. I happened to be living in Jakarta during both of these floods, the 1990 and the 1995-96 flood, and saw how unusually destructive they were as compared to the more routine high water events. In fact, these two floods signaled the beginning of the flooding crisis that would precipitate a fundamental change in the planning priorities within Jakarta. Another historic flood in 2002, and then an even more devastating flood uh, in 2007, raised the awareness, uh, raised the environmental awareness of government officials to a level that had not been the case uh, since, since the early decades of Batavia's settlement. Post-flood assessments, ironically conducted by hired Dutch water consultants, disclosed a host of major problems. Neglect of routine clearing of the waterways of debris and sediment, lack of control of urban runoff, encroachment of urban development in the river channels, thereby marketedly reducing their capacity to handle rainfall, and paving over areas designated for absorbing rainfall and runoff. But most important was land subsidence, which accounted for the escalated level of flooding. The sinking of Jakarta, and he's pointing to where the, where the land was when they originally built that piece of the flood wall across, the, across North Jakarta. The sinking of Jakarta owed to over-reliance on subsurface water because the surface water was so polluted that little could be used for domestic and commercial use. The over-reliance on groundwater caused the shallow and deep aquifers to collapse, while at the same time, there was less space for new infiltration to support the aquifer recharge. The subsidence problem was actually first identified in the 1970s, but ignored. In the aftermath of the 2007 flood, it was determined that parts of North Jakarta, uh, part, again, where the original city was located, had sunk over four meters. Jakarta now faced an environmental crisis resulting from insufficient land development regulation over the previous three decades, but also a failure to manage its water resources. The response to the flooding problem, which took another two floods and more than five years to get started, was to undertake a mass dredging effort with funding support from the World Bank, the so-called Jakarta Emergency Dredging Initiative, or JETI. To do it required wholesale removal of communities long occupying the riverfronts. Rather than admitting to the city's neglect, the government blamed the problems of polluted water, debris in the waterways, and the environmental crisis in general on the informal residents. What was not acknowledged was that it had been the unstated policy of the Jakarta governments for decades to allow informal settlements to set up where they wanted to in lieu of building sufficient affordable public housing. Since these spontaneous developments were never connected to infrastructure, the only alternative was to use the rivers and canals and streams for their needs. This was not done in a clandestine way, however, but was openly accepted as a necessary approach, even in some of the compounds that had been built and occupied for decades. Pipes from the waterfront houses extended into the rivers and open defecation was common. I got to show you, I wanted to show you how it worked in, in, in practice. As a result, what began after the 2002 flood as some selective informal community removals became wholesale clearance to support the waterway improvements under jetty and waterfront flood wall construction. All of this with limited options of affordable replacement housing for those displaced. Plans for extending sanitation services throughout the city were prepared with the help of consultants, but like previous plans were rejected as too expensive. 
Moreover, inadequate attention was given to the upstream pollution of these waterways that exacerbated the city's problems. Rethinking the overall structure of Jakarta's environment was another outcome of the post-2007 flood assessment. The Waterfront City Project envisioned started and stymied as a result of the Asian financial crisis in the 1990s and the resignation of Suharto in May 1998, reemerged in the aftermath of the 2007 flood in a different form, but justified both to accommodate new development and also as a flood mitigation strategy. Whereas the Suharto waterfront city scheme received only mild opposition since Outward, outward criticism of government policies was not countenanced by the new order government. The new plan for the city, uh, for a city built on reclaimed land in the sea faced fierce opposition from environmental and community organizations now empowered <clears throat> under the democratic Indonesia that had developed in the post Suharto era. At the same time, but without much success, community groups also challenged the compound clearance efforts and tendered alternative schemes to create new affordable communities. The big waterfront scheme languished, but the more community-focused improvements, including schemes to regreen the riverfront and to enable community rebuilding in place, also were ignored. And that brings us to the present. With an urban environmental crisis, and an ambitious plan to build a new capital city. I would suggest that the plan to move the capital city to East Kalimantan will divert precious resources, resources from the environmental improvements needed, not just in Jakarta and the satellite cities that surround it, but from all of Indonesia's large cities that suffer from similar environmental deficits. If one looks at the projected Indonesian budget for 2020 to 2024 as one bit of key evidence, notice the minuscule percentage dedicated to water and sanitation. It is clear that water and sanitation and general environmental cleanup is a decidedly low government funding priority. It is likely that much of the new upscale and public development in the urbanizing periphery uh, will include infrastructure for new homes and businesses, but what does that mean for addressing the profound pollution in the rivers and canals or weaning the 30 million inhabitants and all the businesses from excessive reliance on groundwater sources? And that, that really accounts for the sinking city and the heightened level of flooding. For the center city, there needs to be a new agenda and a significantly greater focus on alternative ecosystem strategies. These include a different approach to stormwater management rather than allowing it to flow directly into the waterways uh, uh, using innovative diversion strategies. There should be improved greening achieved through high performance landscape systems. It's not just a matter of removing debris from the rivers and canals, which requires improved efforts, of course, but also examining various bioengineering strategies to begin to remove pollutants which has been demonstrated to work at different scales in the case of Singapore's Bishan Park and a current project in China that is transforming through application of plants that can purify the waters. This is potentially a game-changing strategy. This should be undertaken with a revised focus on Jakarta's kampungs that seeks to preserve or at least rehabilitate these communities, not unlike the kampung improvement program of the 1960s, but what should be a new generation of green and clean compound improvement efforts. The green, com the green KIP would involve community-scaled wastewater removal and purification systematically installed throughout Jakarta, as well as access to clean water under a planned intervention scheme. This would involve adding green spaces to support small-scale agriculture that has been shown to work in other communities as a way to support life there while dealing with stormwater management. Also improved solid waste removal, which is provided in other communities should be provided to ensure that there would not be a justification for using the waterways. Added recreational facilities and planned commercial spaces would be part of the community planning. And this would be planned and implemented over some reasonable period of time. 
Already on the drawing boards, as suggested by this image from local designers, there are proposals for riverfront canal transformations that can convert these ribbons of water wastewater to desirable landscapes to elevate the urban environment. This could produce a very different future for the Jakarta environment. But for now, same city, two worlds. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to open it up for questions from either the live audience or the Zoom audience. Hold on a second. This one question here, two questions from the live audience. Go ahead, uh, Sam. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, my question for you when it sounds like Jakarta, like a lot of other major coastal cities, is designing its main flood migration plans around flood walls and canals. Is this intended to be a long term mitigation plan, or is that just a temporary measure until the capital can be moved and relieve some of those issues? Now, un unfortunately, I think that. At this stage, uh, and, and there's been a lot of uh, research done on this and demonstrating that the, the sort of the hard gray, uh, hard infrastructure approach has really been the primary way of thinking about it, even though the Dutch have been giving them ideas about uh, their uh, allowing rivers to run where they need to run. Uh, but you can see in the, again, I don't have enough images in this presentation to show you, but they're basically recreating uh, the, the concrete channels in the rivers that they are dredging in Jakarta, uh, which is really gonna uh, sort of keep the same uh, operation. The, the waterfront community, and again, there wasn't enough time to develop that, and it's gone through a number of different uh, permutations. But one of the ideas was to actually create a massive polder uh, that would enable the city to be able to manage high water events like they do in the Netherlands and uh, allow for uh, uh, pumping water uh, away from places that otherwise would, um, would flood. But what none of the strategies other than the recommendations to do something have come up with an answer to the uh, excessive reliance on groundwater uh, for their water supply. And you know, the, even though um, the new communities in the suburbs are going to have wastewater treatment or you know, through, through septic tanks, or in some cases, community facilities, they're still taking the water out of the ground. There's just very little of the surface water. There's one big dam uh, about 60 kilometers away from Jakarta that brings um, a mountain water that's relatively clean into the water system in Jakarta. But even by the time the water gets there, it's actually heavily uh, polluted because it follows, it's not piped in, it actually comes in a canal. Uh, and so it's subject to the same kinds of effects. So again, the, they, they haven't embraced the kind of strategies. I just had a student do a project uh, for her thesis, looking at the response to Katrina uh, and what's happened since uh, Katrina. And very clearly New Orleans has embraced a, a green gray combination with, with, and even the core down there has added greening strategies rather than just trying to uh, shore up the, the flood walls there. So. But unfortunately, uh, you know, a few people are talking about it, me, but uh, it really, there, are, there really aren't enough voices and certainly voices in government that recognize the value of alternative strategies. Zainab? Um, thank you for your talk. My question is, to your knowledge, do you know if any of previous future development plans like in the previous years have allocated more money to their water and sanitation, or is the budget going down, or has the budget always just been that low for water and sanitation? Well, I, it's interesting. I, I, a friend of mine, when I was working there uh, for the National Planning Development Board on, a, on an urban finance and, and environmental project in the 90s, got to be friends with a, a consultant working on their, what they call the clean project, which was actually privatizing the uh, 
water systems. It ended up uh, being a, a disaster because it was uh, it, it it all of the recommendations of privatizing water um, uh, failed to produce any kind of improvement. And Indonesia, to its credit, uh, has actually um, through its Supreme Court actually ruled that water is a right, not a commodity. And they've basically canceled their private sector contracts with Jakarta and restoring the local water authority. And, and again, that's, that's not a panacea, but it's a step in the right direction. But um, the plans that have been done for sanitation, they just simply say, logistically, we can't afford to do it. And they had one plan that was done, and, and there's been a couple of good articles by Scott, Indonesian scholars and uh, written on this, uh, of trying to divide the city up into various sectors and put in um, uh, some kind of wastewater uh, improvements, because again, there's nothing, you know, in, the, in most of the city, unless it's a relatively new community that has its own septic tanks, um, there's, and, and the business district has some, but there's just no wastewater service available. But in fact, there are technologies, and that's what I was getting to, again, just mentioning it briefly at the end, but there are technologies at the community level that you could actually do this, and the city could, in fact, systematically do it. Getting back to the consultant, I asked them about that. I, I pointed out how the national budget was uh, so skewed towards transportation and energy, very little on water and sanitation. He pointed out, I said, well, actually the national government rarely does anything in this area. It really is a local responsibility. And uh, although Jakarta has uh, lots of resources, they too have put most of it, uh, their priorities on uh, helping people get houses, uh, making uh, private housing more affordable for middle-income people with some subsidies, and the and the transportation uh, innovations, you know, the MRT and the, uh, their contribution to the to the light rail. It's they they just do not accept this as as something that is undermining the city. Even though, again, my argument is that's. That's one of the reasons, you know, that moving the capital to East Kalimantan uh, uh, is being pursued. And the law that actually will make that official is being debated now. And even though they're, they've got planners and they're working on the plans for it, they still have to go through the process of, of uh, legalizing uh, the new capital, which should happen sometime in uh, early uh, 2022. It's just, they just... You know, again, this is sort of the carryover from the 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 colonial experience that you know it, we it would be nice to have it, but um, where you find it is in this not in the center city, but in some of the outlying communities that also face severe environmental problems, where uh, community water facilities are fairly close to their septic tanks and there's a lot of a lot of uh, um, unfortunate uh, mixing of the two and the water quality is quite low and and there's other forms of, of uh, waste management that aren't being well cared for but in the city itself again then that's 10 million population of 10 million it, unfortunately it's just a low priority and I think it's a mistake Thank you. Um, yeah. Anyone uh, online have a question or anyone else live? Okay, we have one from Vincent here. Uh, okay. Thank you, talk, sir. Um, a quick question. In regards to the timeline that you mentioned about uh, potentially moving that new capital, with the recent president, I think you showed his first term was, uh, or the current president, first term was 2013 to 2020 area and the next one, 2021 to 2028. During that election cycle, was there, or I guess, was his second term uh, up for election? And if so, was that something that was a part of his public platform? Or was that <laughs> the more of like a background agenda that once he was in, he sprang into maybe public knowledge? Well, that's that's a great question. And I'll give you a short version of the, of the really complex story. And I, I don't know at all. The, his, his, 
I'll give you just a little background. He was the governor of Jakarta, uh, elected in a, uh, a pretty significant uh, victory in 2012. He was so popular as governor of Jakarta that he ran for the presidency two years later and won it quite handily in 2014. It's a five-year term for the presidency. So the election occurred in, in 2019. I was there when they were holding the election. You know, this country of almost 300 million people held the election in a half day. They had about an 80% participation rate. I mean, it's just incredible. But it was fiercely contested because um, Suharto's uh, ex-son-in-law, um, a general, uh, was running against him uh, with, uh, and this is not, uh, this is simply a fact, with strong support from the Trump administration and Trump supporters, it was a really nip and tuck election. Uh, anyway, Jokowi got his strongest support from the provinces in Kalimantan, uh, not the most populous areas in, in, in Indonesia, but I think he won four or five of the provinces in Kalimantan. Uh, and I happened to be there uh, with my wife. We were going on a, on a river cruise in, in the central Borneo. And our young guide was telling us, oh, yeah, Jokowi was here. And you know, we think he might, you know, they're talking about maybe moving the capital here. And maybe they'll come back to Palankaraya, where Sukarno had proposed the capital. Well, they, they weren't going to go back to central Borneo. It was it it's it really would not have worked there. The two cities in East Kalimantan are much better. Plus, the government owns almost all the property that they would the great majority of the property that they would develop the city. So it reduces some of the cost. But yes, it was definitely part of the campaign. And he did win. Clearly, but but much closer than he expected given how popular he had been in his first term uh, in office. And so, you know, again, that's why I said the question, well, why are they doing it? Well, you know, I, I can't answer that exactly, but they mention all the problems in Jakarta, but I think it's more than just traffic. Again, I really do think it's, it, and it's also to create new opportunities for economic development in a part of Indonesia that is strong, but strong on natural resources. That's a big mining area. Uh, it's also where there's lots of, of uh, palm oil plantations, uh, which are now contributing a lot of the, uh, the biofuel to the world market. Um, so, you know, there's lots of reasons for doing it. But I also, I really do think he, he has been a, the sort of the green president. And I do think, you know, for his own ego, uh, building a new capital city that reflects smart, green, sustainable development uh, in ways that Jakarta is just not going to do it, even though Jakarta has, has done some, some good changes in the transportation, in expanding sidewalks, but they just don't deal with that fundamental environmental uh, legacy that they inherited it, but then neglected it uh, in favor of, of new development for such a long time. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Chris. We're at uh, 350. So I want to just let everybody go and we appreciate you coming to the department and we've learned a lot in your talk today. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. It's always fun to talk about it. And thanks for your good questions.